Uh, but trauma is a really interesting thing because trauma is relative. You know, you can take two people in the exact same situation, saw the exact same thing happen, and one can walk away completely, you know, typical, normal, if you want to call it. And then the unbothered other one, by right, it. unbothered that they processed it properly. And the other one can walk away and have uh, end up having PTSD symptoms. And, you know, they're. There's a lot of studies now trying to look at like pre-existing things of cortisol levels or genetics and things like that that could be, you know, determined that this person may be more likely to walk away from, you know, if they're in the military or whatnot. Well, it was like that shooting in the parking garage, mm -hmm. uh, for example. I, w I was When that happened, my wife and I were in the middle of switching out sort of shifts at the hospital. We usually do four or five days at a time and then we'll switch. And it's like, okay, I'm going to go home with the other girls and you'll stay here and if we're there for these long stints, you know, but we were in the middle of switching out when that shooting thing happened. And once it got all settled, like I was talking to investigators, we were looking at security footage. I helped my ID guys, da, 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 da. And then everything was good. Everything was settled. I'd written my statements and I was like, okay, I need to get home. Cause I gotta get the other kids and blah, 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 get dinner going. And you know, it was a whole thing. Well, then Brandy called me. She's like, they, they keep sending people to the room to check on you to make sure you're okay. I'm like, I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I didn't get shot. They're like, no, no, no. They sent like a therapist up and they sent like all these people they keep sending like to make sure you don't need to talk about it and you're okay. I'm like, and she was la She said she laughed at them and she's like, no, no, no. He's fine. He's built for this. <laughs> like, he's totally fine. But it right. makes sense now that you're saying like the yeah. trauma and the potential for PTSD. And right. well, but let me take a step back because now I'm thinking of another thought that I had recently when I went back to the hospital last week. I had like trust issues, like real trust issues. Like every time a door opened and I'm like waiting for something to pop off, you know, I'm like, yep. it's not like I was waiting, but I was like, is there going to be something on the other side of this door? Is there something around this corner? Is that guy walking past me going to be cool? You know, all, and you like these trust issues for yeah. a minute. So, which is, I don't know if you call that PTSD, but it's, it's kind of like, we would call that acute stress disorder. Okay. Right. Which is essentially, you know, PTSD symptoms, Small right scale. after, okay. right, right after. But if that lasted for six months and you're still feeling that way, you know, next year, right. That then that's a little bit more. It's kind of like, um, I have to imagine it's, it's a lot like you're driving in a car and you're going a little fast and you pass a cop and you're like, Ooh, or a cop comes up behind mm -hmm. you with the lights on and then they go around you and pull over the other guy. And you're like, suddenly you're driving like. You're like yeah. sweating bullets for a minute mm -hmm. and then you're driving like perfect for like 10 minutes and that mm -hmm. kind of calms and then you go back to driving yep. a little fast to yep. loosen up a little. Yep. Yep. So that's. Yeah. And do, so you want to know like how trauma impacts the brain of why, why you were yeah. feeling that way. Yeah. So what we've learned over time through brain scans is, so there's a small little part of our brain called the amygdala. Um, it is responsible for fight or flight, mm. right? So the fear, it's the piece that kicks in that uh, adrenaline with us, without us even really having to put much thought into, I need to be scared right now. And so that part of the brain after trauma, and again, once again, trauma is relative. When trauma exp is experienced, that part of the brain becomes hyperactive. So it is going to be on guard a lot more. So that like, well, who's behind this door? Did somebody behind me, right? It's what the, was that noise? Yeah. Right. You know, the, the old World War II vets, uh, Vietnam vets who didn't want to sit in, you know, with their back to anybody, right? Mm. They want to sit in the corner where they can see the whole room. So that is because that part of the brain is now on the go all the time. It Which is, is probably waiting. exhausting. It is. Yes. Because you're on high alert. Yep. Hyper focused on all these small things. Yep. It's like, you know, think about being on a roller coaster and having adrenaline going all the time, you know, and never getting really a break from that. And so the amygdala talks with the hippocampus, which the hippocampus is the part of our brain that's responsible for, you know, memories, right? Short term, long term memories. And that part of the brain tends to shrink. And so because it shrinks, when we feel that fear, that amygdala kicks in and it's trying to communicate with our past memories a lot of the times it's just going to pull the memories that are the most scary and so it's reminding you of why you need to be scared mm. and then the frontal cortex of our brain the prefrontal cortex is the part that's responsible for kind of regulating our emotions and that part shrinks as well so it's a lot harder for us to regulate that emotion of fear so 
all that combination in our brain makes it a lot more difficult for us to enjoy life. And that's on the PTSD side of things, right. not so much this with the acute. You, you can have some of that with the acute, but the, the long lasting effects of the brain and that kind of thing, um, not so much. It, it, it's like you were explaining with that driving, right? Where it's like, okay, I can regulate back to my old belief systems. Mm -hmm. So I, as a trauma therapist, I use uh, a trauma approach called uh, EMDR, which is a mouthful. It stands for eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. So eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. And so it does utilize eye movement. Now it's not hypnotizing. We're not trying to get somebody to dissociate and act <laughs> like a duck. Um, so Quack. yeah, it would be really, really weird in a therapy session. But what it's doing is it's mimicking um, the rapid eye movement, the REM sleep. So what we have learned, again, through brain scans and sleep studies is that when people get into REM sleep, their eyes are uh, darting back and forth, mm. right? If you, I don't know if you've ever watched your kids when they're sleeping yeah. and that you just kind of see their eyes moving behind their eyelids. And what we've learned is that that creates what's called a bilateral stimulation. So the left brain and the right brain are active at the same time which is not typical when we're just awake, right? Mm -hmm. We can be more in our left brain, which is emo uh, is communication and language and rationale and, and facts. And the right brain is more emotion and creativity and sensation. Now, depending on a person's personality, they may be more emotional, right? They may be more creative, right? Taylor Swift's going to break up with somebody and write a beautiful song, right? But then you take airplane pilots or military or first responders they do not have, honestly, because they're trained to be non-emotional, they have this period where they are looking at facts and logic a lot more than how they feel. Now, what we are looking for is a healthy balance between the two, right? How do I feel about this, but also what are facts and logic? And so for you, after you have that police car behind you and then he goes around you, right, your logical brain kicks in and says, okay, he wasn't pulling me over. I'm, I'm okay. I can drive now, mm -hmm. right? Now, what happens with trauma is that can tend to get stuck and it gets stuck in our right brain. The memory does. So every time we think of it or we're triggered, we have a something we smell, we see, we hear, we touch, we taste, brings us back to that memory, then we are flooded with the exact same level of emotion that we had when it was, exp when it was happening, mm -hmm. when the trauma was taking place. So it's the stereotypical war veteran who hears the loud boom and jumps under a Shell desk. shock. Right. 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 Which was the old name for PTSD, PTSD. Right. <laughs> or a soldier's heart. They used to call it as well. Yeah. Um, so, so the difference, yeah. go ahead, finish your thought. Well, so it is looking at how can we get that stuck point and reprocess it to a spot where the belief system changes, right? So if, if I get into a car accident and now my trauma tells me driving is dangerous where I never necessarily used to have that belief system, that's what in, in trauma treatment we're trying to target. People get really scared because they're like, I don't really want to talk about all the details. I don't want to talk about the trauma. It's too disturbing to me, right? And again, it's because it's stuck in that right brain and they, they will feel that same emotion and they're scared of that emotion. So it's looking at, okay, if we can get them a bilateral stimulation utilizing eye movement, and I can tell you more about that if you want to know, but that allows new neuro pathways to be created so that the brain actually communicates properly. Mm. So it, in layman's terms, I would say it's taking something from your long-term memory, putting it at the front of your brain, and then letting it get flooded with emotion and, and logic and facts. And so the flooding of both sides of the brain allows your brain to actually heal.